Okay, good morning. Um, I'm Wal. We're out here on the Dodman. Um, we're just going to have a look around what's around out here from the archaeological point of view and from the wildlife. So at the moment we're about halfway up the track to Dodman Point, coming up from the hamlet of Pen Air, where the National Trust has a car park. So this site is all owned by the National Trust. Um, one of the biggest interesting features you can find out on the Dodman is the bulwark, which is an Iron Age um, ditch and bank defence of the whole of a headland. So all together from cliff to cliff it's just over 900 metres long. Um, it was probably built in the late Iron Age as far as we know, we don't have any direct evidence, but it cuts off the whole of a headland. It's the biggest cliff castle in the southwest and quite probably the biggest cliff castle in the country. Um, so it's about the total area behind it, flat area, is about 20 hectares. If you know Maiden Castle in Dorset, it's about twice the size of that. Okay, so what we're going to do now, we're going to walk up the track, walk in for bulwark itself. Okay. Okay, so we just got into the, uh, the end of the track coming up from Pen Air, and we're now actually in the bulwark itself. We're in the inner ditch. So if you see behind me, you can see the height of the inner bank. Uh, the highest point, which is further down towards the western end, is about six metres high. You've got to imagine when it was originally built with erosion and the ditch filling it, you probably add a couple of metres onto that. Um, at the moment, you can see there's an inner bank and an outer bank. Originally, there'd been another ditch and another bank outside that, but over the decades, decades, centuries, it's been the outer bank's been pushed back into the ditch um, to fill it in to make the fields bigger. Okay, so now what you have to remember is this: this was all dug by hand, no JCBs, um, all by pick and shovel. Okay, so we're just going to head a bit further down the bulwark. And um, we're going to go and have a look at some of the wildlife that we find here. Okay, so we've come down a little bit further down the um, bulwark and head a bit west. As you can see behind me, one of the problems within this winter when it gets really wet, it gets quite muddy. Um, we start to get small ponds, especially in the wheel tracks. One of the really interesting things about these wheel tracks is what lives in them. Okay, so they only last for short periods, these ponds but they have some very important red data book species living in them. And we're just going to see if we can get a closer look at them. Okay, so we're going to see if we can actually see these with the camera we've got. They're quite small. So the animal we're looking at, if, you can, if we can zoom in here, is a fairy shrimp. Uh, can you see one? What we've got here. So it's back there, is a, if you follow, well, see where my finger is. Okay, there's a couple of them swimming along. So these are shrimp, basically they're shrimps, but freshwater shrimps. Um, they don't live for very long, they'll, they'll stay as adults until the ponds dry up. Um, and once the ponds dry up, the eggs will just stay in the mud of the bottom of the ponds. They can last up, they reckon they can last up to 15 to 20 years without any water. And then as soon as they get the right conditions again, the eggs will hatch. They'll mature, they'll lay more eggs, and the cycle goes on. Um, and the reason why they live in these ponds is because they can't cope with the predators. So in, in normal ponds, which are permanent ponds, you tend to get uh, predators like great diving beetle larvae, and they're big enough to eat newts. So anything like these fairy shrimps will just don't last. Okay, and later on, when we come into the spring, you, you'll find spawn in here, frog spawn, toad spawn, newt spawn. They don't often hatch, or if they hatch, they don't often go to maturity because the ponds dry out too quick. Okay, so we're going to head back out of the bulwark now. We're going to carry on out, um, heading out towards Dobbin Point. And we'll have a look at you know, one of the other reasons this site is so important. Okay, so we walk right to the eastern end of the bulwark, well, as far as we can go safely, and this is where the coast path linked up with the coast path going heading out to Dobbin Point. But this, the bulwark itself dives off down the cliffs and goes right down to where the cliffs meet the sea. Um, so yeah, it's quite a feature in itself. It, it incorporates some of the natural features. Um, and if we carry on looking around the view from here, you can see behind me you've got Vault Beach, or Bo, Vault or Bow Beach. Um, interesting about these cliff casts in Cornwall, they all seem to be associated with trade. And we have to think, we think about trade now, ships coming to harbours and mooring up. As you go back to sort of days when sort of this kind of period, most of the boats were flat bottomed and they beached for the trade. 
So having two shallow beaches, one either side of Dobbin Point, could make it a really important point for trade. Um, and it also, Dobbin Point is also the highest point on the South Cornwall coast. So from the head when we get out, we can see we have a massive range of view. Um, don't know if you can pan around and we can see the furthest point of land we can see here today is just about visible is um, Rainhead, just outside Plymouth. So you can see it covers a lot of the sea areas, so it's really a good place to control trade from here. Okay, so we're going to move on from a little bit of the archaeology. We're going to go and have a look at some of the wildlife we can find at this time of year. Okay, we're going to head out onto the main fields. Okay, so we're right out of the Dodman now. We're on one of the big fields on the eastern side. One of the things we look about wildlife, we always try to look and think about the birds and the flowers, the trees. Um, what we rarely think about is the hidden wildlife. So most of the year, what we're going to look at now, you can't see because they're under the ground. So this time of year, when it gets moist and warm, we tend to get the fruity bodies come up. So what we talk about is fungi. And Dogman is a really important um, fungi site, especially in these grasslands. Um, they haven't been ploughed for a long, long time. And so with mycelium, the fungi flora is really, really dense. So if we come down and have a look here, we've got um, just emerging one of the scarlet wax caps. I'll say one of them just because fungi are quite hard to... Uh, to identify and there's several different scarlet ones who look similar these are quite big ones and if you come across you can see they just they matured really and they're just about to go over so you know something to do on a day like today where it's quite nice um fungi are still out come out and have a look see how many different species you can find you don't have to necessarily be able to name them but it's quite so we head up head up here So here's a different um, scarlet, one of the scarlet wax caps, much, much tiny, tiny little thing. It's possibly one of the blackening wax caps, so as it matures it goes from a red to a black colour. I can move up here, I've got a wax cap. Again, wax cap, we really call, really be, we call that because they actually feel like they're waxy, sort of a bit gelatinous, a bit sticky. And then we can head down over here. Oh, going back this way. Oh, this purpley um, looking one. Oh, I'm quite sure this is a um, ballerina wax cap, one of the rarer ones. But I'm not sure what fungi aren't my area of speciality. <laughs> and we'll just finish off having a look over here. These white ones and these are snowy wax caps. Okay, so you know that's just in an area we just covered an area of about oh 20 or 30 square meters, and we've got four or five different species in here. Um, and they'll vary through times of year because you obviously fruit at different times. It's worth just wandering over and having a look. So we're just gonna wander over and if we find anything else which is really of interest, we'll we'll point them out to you. Okay. No, not really wildlife, but quite often spotted out on the Dodman are the animals used for grazing the lower slopes. So if you look behind me again, you can see the Shetland ponies. Um, these are run by the National Trust wardens, and they keep these lower cliffs open. You know, 20 years ago, these, most of these lower cliffs were covered in scrub, and the National Trust have been gradually clearing them and open up again to the rich grass and the rare plant species which you quite often find down here um, as well as the insects and the other wildlife okay fungi here so these aren't wax caps um, i'm not sure of the actual species but look the shape of the cap they look like a caprinus one of the caprinus species but it's interesting they're growing near the, the cow dung so they could be actually growing out of the dung um, and again the dung the dung Cattle dung is quite important for wildlife out here because um, you get some insects which uh, which feed on. So you get a lot of dung beetles which feed on the dung. And when you get um, hornet robber flies, which are a robber fly, about the biggest robber fly in this country, about an inch long, which then feed on the dung beetles. So grazing these sites is really important. 
and also for maintaining the fungi. If we let this go, go and stop grazing it, um, it would just turn to scrub. So, you know, this site is managed by the National Trust and the tenants down at Penair on Penair Farm. And they graze this site with Dexter cattle, um, which we sell for public. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in buying some of the meat, it's really good to eat. Um, if you just look online for Penair Farms, I'm sure you'll come across it. They have their own website. And then if we just head down here, I think we can see what, what's used on the lower cliffs as well. Okay, we're sort of heading a bit further out to the headland now, to the, um, the point itself. Um, but interestingly, even though we're now in December, there's still flowers um, out here, partially because they're protected by the scrub you can see around us. Um, and also we're in Cornwall and it never really stops. So if you have a quick look down here, quite a common plant, um, not rare at all. This is red campion. You can quite often find small numbers flowering most of the year. Um, actually behind it we can see some of the ferns which grow out here as well. So this is a uh, heart's tongue fern. So a heart being um, a deer. So it's supposed to be like a deer tongue. The other name I know for it is TikTok fern. Because when you break it, it just goes TikTok. But there you go. So we'll just head, head over here to another really important part which a lot of people just dismiss. And actually, a lot of people damage it. Um, just so they don't think it isn't actually bad, a bad plant. We've got an elder bush here, but it's covered in ivy. And a lot of people go around in woodlands and areas and cut ivy off trees, which is a shame. I can understand it because they believe it damages the tree, but all ivy does is use trees for support. You can see here, this, this ivy has just finished flowering. So it's really late next to source for insects, really important. And you can just see the fruit, the berries starting to appear here. And they'll ripen, some of these are actually ripening now, but they normally ripen sort of around January, January, February, so they're a really early source of food for birds as well. But what else you do is get a really dense network of growth around the trunks, and a lot of insects will overwinter in here. Uh, things, even things like butterflies, so brimstone butterflies, um, the original butterfly, they're the yellowy colour ones you get in woodland. When they hang, their colour is very similar to a dying ivy leaf, so this kind of colour. So camouflage will in there, but they'll, they'll, they'll stay in there over winter, along with other insects. Okay, but really important, so if you see ivy, please don't cut it off the trees. It's not going to damage unless the tree's already weakened for some reason and then it can take it over and topple it through its weight. But the trees normally has to be weak from a fungal attack or drought or something else or age before the ivy will actually damage it. Okay. A very common shrub you find that pretty much throughout the British Isles is common gorse. You see behind me. So beginning of December, lots of flowers on it. It's one of the few shrubs you'll see which will find in flower somewhere all year round. So there's an old saying which goes with it, when gorse is out of flower, kissing is out of season, which tells you gorse is never out of flower. Okay, but again, important um, pollinator. Um, insects will go in the dense areas of it. It's evergreen. It used to be cut and quite often crushed in granite rollers up on the moors as, as stock feed in the winter. Uh, so many uses. And of course, every, anyone who's ever seen um, wood-fired ovens this is your classic fuel for those fires. They bound into into tight um, bundles. Then put dry once they're really really dead and dry. They've been put in the oven. They burn really hot, really fast. So again, important part of our heritage to remember these kind of things. So let's just carry on a little bit further. So we're actually now at the highest point of Dalton Point. 
um, which is just over 300 feet. And as I said before, it's highest point on the South Cornish coast. And we're in a little compound, which is known as a watch house. So the region when this was built, you have to imagine there was no trees out, no scrub out here. Uh, the tide mark says this was, sorry, tide mark, tide maps say that this was all arable land out here. Um, and this was built as a signal station during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, if I remember right, it was about around about 1785 when it was first built. And there's a series of signal stations built along the coasts to send messages backwards and forwards up to the Admiralty in London and to communicate with ships out at sea. Um, where I'm standing now, there'd been a, a 50 foot mast, which would, the signals would be hung off. You can still see um, there's one at each corner, and if you look over into the it's called the pulpit. Um, so this is where you'd be standing. The little bit of metal on the top is most likely to be um, a cleat to tie off the, the ropes at lo to lower higher and raise and lower the, the symbols which we use on the masts. Uh, and then next we have the watch house. So after Napoleonic, Napoleonic Wars, there's no need to keep a signal station here. They all went into disuse. And then but these areas were taken over by the Coast Guards because of this amount of smuggling which was going on. And this was manned by a small contingent out of Gorrent Haven. Um, and there was a rule that whenever a certain family was at, from Gorrent Haven was out at sea, this post had to be manned. Because they knew who was doing it. There was also tales that the customers excised, someone came down to London to check on them and they were drinking the pub with the smugglers. So how effective it was, it's hard to tell. Um, we can't see from here, but if you look over, if you go over to the east side on the Gribbon, you know the day mark up there. Um, that's the next site in the, in the chain of signal stations going going east. Okay, so we'll head out right out to the, the end of the promontory now. Here we are, right out at the end of Dobman Point. So the iconic symbol which most people know who's ever been out here, the cross. Um, built in 1886 by a local vicar from Cahays. Um, a lot of people says it's a shipping, um, warning for shipping, because a lot of wrecks off Dobman Point. Um, if you go and look at wreck maps, the whole water out here is just littered. Um, but as far as we can make out, he was a bit of a mystic this vicar and he built it at the end of the 19th century the belief at the end of the century would see the second coming of Christ. Um, it said he at the first the night after it was built he, he actually slept out here to to try and have some dreams. So we won't talk about mushrooms or anything else out here but but you can see why people come out here and what so important that the views from here are actually absolutely stunning. And that width of view, if you pan over to the west, the furthest land point you can see over to the west is Black Head on the Lizard. Around the seaport Scaffo, the head of a Roseland Peninsula, Port Scaffo, the new stone off the end of Nair Head. Unfortunately, we can't see on this camera we, we're using, it hasn't got a zoom, but if you look out here, you can see it's a hole flight of gannets out here, dive bombing, fishing out here. Um, quite an interesting bird. The nearest place they nest is in Pembrokeshire. Uh, and in the nesting season, you can still find them feeding out here. So they come out here and feed and then fly home again. But the actual seas around here, the bays, the two bays you can see either side, are really important for overwintering birds. So you get in things like great northern divers, um, coming out here, um, red throated divers, grebes. Um, and if we lose these sites through sort of degradation of the waters, we're going to lose all these species as well. So it's not just the land we have to be thinking about. And it, you know, the other thing about these areas out here, which is so good, is that the air is relatively clean compared to you know, a lot of places we live. And you can tell this from the amount of lichen that grows here. So if we just turn around and have a look at these 
old black fords behind us. Very small, but probably very old, but wind swept. You see they're just covered in like every inch of the of the bark is covered. You get sort of these low growing lichens, you get crusting lichens which sit really tight. And then maybe if we hop over, we just walk down here, we can see some of the very what used to be called sea ivory. These really sort of fluffy lichens here. And lichens are an interesting species. They're not a fungi and they're not an algae, but they're a combination of the two. So the fungi provides the body and the algae provides the green co the colours of them and the photosynthesis. Um, and they'll depend which species you are, they pair with different algae. The other thing that these lichens are really important for is the lichenoids, the, the chemicals which they grow within them. There's a lot of research now being medical value of these. Um, and prior to that, when we go back into our past, these were really important for, for dyes. We used to use different lichens for different colour dyes. Um, so most of what we think about as wildlife nowadays used to be our kitchen garden in some ways. For food, so you obviously got black form for sloes, um, to, dye, to dye stuff, to medicines, so willow. We haven't seen any willow today, but there's willow grows out on here, and the bark is where aspirin comes from originally. So we'd have to, we're looking at these sites, looking at the importance of how important everything was originally in that day and age. So we'll just have a quick look at the view. We can see how the grazing going, you can see the tracks on those lower slopes, and these are now being grazed. Before we carry on, we'll walk round and then back along the bulwark to finish this walk. Okay. Okay, so we just kind of come to the end of a walk here around the Dodman. <coughs> We're back back to the bulwark. We're standing on the top of the inner bank at the western end. We're at pretty much at the highest point you can see. If you can go down and see how, how high up we are here. And if we look north across the fields here, what you can see is what's, what's left of a medieval strip field system. Pretty much frozen in time here. Um, so if you enjoyed the walk, come out, come out and have a look around, see what you can find, if you find any wildlife, um, go onto Facebook, load it up, tell us what you've seen on Freebase Wildlife's um, I Spy Wildlife. Um, and then if you else you know, enjoy it, come and explore. So I'll just leave you now. Uh, we're going to head back to Penair and I think probably a nice hot cup of tea. Okay, thank you.